In the name of Jesus, amen. It is so good to see you guys again. It's wonderful. We have awesome members in this congregation, and I wish we could all join together, and one day we will again. Today I want to look at Mary Magdalene, who showed up in last week's Gospel reading for Easter Sunday. And she, along with uh, a few other women, arrived at the tomb of Jesus first. And let me refresh your memory as to Mary Magdalene, okay? Because you're going to have a test on this after the sermon, this side of the church. <laughs> uh, in history, people have associated Mary with... Um, for instance, the woman caught in adultery in John chapter 8 also associated her with the woman who washes Jesus' feet with her tears in Luke chapter 7. But there's really no reason in the Bible to do that. There's no connection there biblically. And of course, there's a lot of nonsense about Mary Magdalene as well. Uh, so, for instance, you get nonsense in the apocryphal pseudo-gospels and then some more recent novels. Uh, imagine all sorts of fanciful fiction about her, but, you know, hey, making money, right? Well, Luke tells us about Mary Magdalene, that she's one of the committed followers of Jesus Christ, and with him also the 12 apostles. And by the way, by the way, it wasn't just Mary Magdalene, but there's a group of women that accompanied Jesus in the twelve. Some of them supported the ministry financially, and others, well, all of them together, and this is my assumption, my assumption is that they were also sharing the message of the kingdom of God, especially, you can imagine in that day, in that society, sharing the message, especially with the, the women in the cities that they would go to. At any rate, Mary Magdalene herself, Luke tells us, that she had seven demons cast out of her. And Mark tells us that it was Jesus himself that did that, right? So we have no reason to believe Mary was particularly a simple, simple bad woman, as sometimes she's made out to be. We do have every reason to believe that Mary was a very, very oppressed woman. But she was also very grateful. And she was full of faith and commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ for what he had done for her. So today I want to look at Mary Magdalene, and, and this is the point of the sermon, okay? I want to ask and answer the question, uh, what does she teach us that is relevant to living during a pandemic, or frankly, any other adversity in life, all right? Before we do, let's go ahead. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, and we pray that we would give you due respect and honor, that we would give you the glory and the honor that you deserve as our God and our Savior, that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive it, to be attentive to it. And Lord, we pray as we are, you would work in our minds, in our hearts, that you would transform us, you would sanctify us, you would keep us, you would encourage us, you would exhort us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, the point of the message, of the sermon. I want to look at Mary Magdalene and ask, what does she teach us that is relevant during this time of pandemic or frankly any other adversity in life, okay? Um, you've gone through plenty of adversity in your life. You know what it's like. You, you uh, over here, you've had some adversity, but you know there's, there's much more to come. <laughs> Hallelujah, praise the Lord, right? Uh, it's just a matter of fact. Uh, but as to regard to Mary, remember Mary did not give Jesus lip service. She had this amazing experience, right, with Jesus, and nobody could steal that away from her. And frankly, nobody could steal her faith away either. She walked with Jesus, she traveled with him and the whole crew, uh, and she had experienced these wonderful, glorious miracles. But she also walked with Jesus, listen, 
She also walked with Jesus in the dark moments. Even the darkest moments, right? There, there are plenty of people in Jesus' day and in our own day who will turn away from Christ when dark is the road. When there's discouragement or maybe they're angry at God. Maybe God hasn't fulfilled their expectations or perhaps they just want to get out from under God because they don't want to have any rules, right? No rules, just right. And so they'll turn away. John Bunyan, I don't know if you read this with us, but John Bunyan has this great novel. Uh, it, well, it's actually an allegory, of a great work of English literature called Pilgrim's Progress. Did you read that one? Yeah, no? Well, you should. It's a great book, um, at least in my opinion. And again, it's an allegory. And in there, one of the characters is a fellow named Mr. Byens and his wife. And again, it's allegory, so his name means something. He's all about worldly ends. What's in it for him? Uh, what prosperity is there? He's not really interested in what's good, right, and holy and truthful. He's in it for the worldly ends. So Mr. Byens is explaining their form of Christianity. And he does it this way. He says, first, you know, me and the missus, First, we never strive against the wind and the way, uh, the wind and the tide. And secondly, we're always fervent in following religion when the sun shines and people applaud. <laughs> That's his form of Christianity. You know, if Mary Magdalene had that form of Christianity, she would have walked away from Jesus a long time ago. Right? Mary had a tough faith, and she faced tough, seemingly insurmountable challenges. When Mary Magdalene and the other women came to the tomb that morning, they didn't expect to see a living Messiah, but a dead Jew, right? And so there were two insurmountable problems before them. The first one was just the stone. As they were going, they were discussing among themselves, how are we going to roll this stone away to prepare the body? How are we going to do it? Because even though they had several women, the stone must have been massive. It must have been very heavy. They couldn't do it. Okay. The big one, though, is this. Even if they found someone to roll away the stone, there was the fact it wasn't changing. Jesus was dead. They didn't come to see his resurrection. They came, they came, they went there because they loved him and they were preparing the body. The Gospel of John, again from last Sunday, tells us about what happened there towards the end. I presume that everybody is gone at this point, except for Mary at the tomb. And John writes about it this way. And they, meaning the messengers of God, they say to her, a woman, why are you weeping? And she says to them, because they have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they've laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and sees Jesus standing there, didn't know that it was Jesus. And Jesus says to her, woman, why are you weeping? Why? Uh, whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener. She says to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where have you, you've laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus says to her, Mary. And she turned and says to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus says to her, Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father, and I go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. You know the imagery I have here at this point? Uh, have you ever had the experience of a child or a grandchild? It, maybe not even, a, I've had this experience, by the way. Uh, a child or a grandchild, or maybe even someone who's not uh, a family member, just so happy to see you, and they come up and give you, you know, grab hold of you, and it's like in your mind you're thinking, you're thinking that, you know, thank you for the love, but I want to breathe now. <laughs> I just picture that with Mary Magdalene and Jesus. You know, some 
versions will translate as she touched him. This is not a good translation in this context. But even when that word is used in other contexts, it's not a light touch. It's forceful, right? But she's clean. This is forceful. I mean, she's just unbelievable. Look at this. Jesus is alive. And there's joy, and there's so much emotion overflowing. She grabs hold of Christ. At any rate, today I wanted to tell you um, they we're going to look at Mary Madeline and ask the question, what does she teach us that is relevant to this time of pandemic and frankly any other adversity in life? And here's the answer. This is what you're going to be quizzed on after the sermon. Oh yeah. Here's the answer. She only saw victory because of the fortitude of faith. She only saw victory because of the fortitude of faith. She only saw victory because she kept walking with Jesus in faith. She went from the darkness of disaster to the cruelty of the crucifixion to see with her own eyes the great gospel glory of the resurrection, right? The, the, the darkness of disaster right there, and I'm sure in other places, but right there in Holy Week, Palm Sunday, oh, it's great, it's wonderful, it's glorious, but day after day it goes down. Darkness of disaster, the cruelty of crucifixion, but the great glory of the resurrection. None of that would have happened if she would have walked nine-tenths of the way with Jesus and then turned away from him. The fortitude of faith brought her to see that great gospel glory of Easter. And by the way, this ties into what the Apostle Paul was talking about. In Acts, I think it's chapter 14, Luke is relating to us the story of the Apostle Paul and it mentions how Paul was going out uh, through what is now modern-day Turkey, and he was encouraging the believers in Christ. And his message of encouragement in one sentence is this. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Now, listen to that. Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. <laughs> Does that sound, where's the encouragement there, someone may ask. You know, what, what is all this talk about these many tribulations? How is that encouraging? Well, the encouragement isn't the tribulation. That has to be said, right? It has to be said. It's true. The encouragement is what's on the other side. See, you've gone through it plenty. I know you have. You've all gone through tribulation. And you will, the longer you live, endure more of it. Tribulation isn't the end. But think about this. For those who have known Jesus and rejected Him and walked away, uh, what happens after tribulation? More tribulation. But for those, for those who know Christ, those who have endured with him, persevered with him in faith, what happens after tribulation? It's the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of heaven. It's glory. So if this was true in Paul's day, through many tribulations we'll enter the kingdom of God, it is certainly true even in our day. Before we reach heaven, there's going to be plenty of trouble along the way. And if we turn away from Christ nine-tenths of the way through in our life, if we walk with Him 99.9% .9 of the way, but then decide to turn away at the end, we will miss out on that experience, that great gospel glory of the resurrection. In this case, our own resurrection to eternal life. Now, I don't mean this to sound harsh, okay? But I think it's true. That's why I'm saying it. Victory isn't for quitters. Victory isn't for those who turn around and leave Jesus. Victory isn't for quitters. And it's that way not only in the spiritual realm, but in the physical realm too. I mean, think, think of this. You know, I've played football. I've done track. I've done wrestling. 
And I can't think of an athlete that I met who was a quitter that was a victor at the same time. Can't think of an athlete who was a quitter who was um, someone who encouraged the team to victory. Victory isn't for quitters. It's for those who have fortitude, who have courage, who have perseverance. And, you know, in this light, when I was writing this, uh, a certain person came to mind, other than Mary Magdalene, by the way, but uh, Matt Bacher. Now, I know most of you here this morning know Matt, and maybe not all of you, you don't know Matt. But uh, Matt... Matt suffered with a brain tumor for about 22 years, right? And about 16 years ago, he was discharged medically from the Marines because of it. And yet, when I'd see Matt, when I was at the Y, on a few occasions, I would see him there as well. And he was in the pool. And he would strap himself somehow to the side of the pool, and he'd work against that tension. And he would, I mean, this was amazing, because I look at Matt and I'm thinking, how could you do that? Because that brain tumor had affected him. He had, uh, he had lost a lot of his ability on the right side of his body, and his, his strength and his movement. And he was there working in that pool, and I kid you not, 100% truthful, he was working harder than anybody else I've seen in the Y. And then later on, when it came to the point he wanted to start a business, and this is as memory serves me, he was getting some pushback on that. And it was, you know, it was this, um, you can't do that. You, you know, get a loan or grant, you know. Your disability won't allow for that. And guess what happened? <laughs> he did it anyways. And a matter of fact, three of us in the congregation, we, we went to one of his firearm classes, and we've had him here before for things revolving around his work as well. Um, that was fortitude, right? That was perseverance. Now we know at the end of the game, or end of a race, whatever it might be, when we're really tired, what's, what's the time for? Well, joy of victory, right? It's also a time of rest, to take a knee, grab a drink, whatever it might be, bend over and try to catch a breath. It's a time of rest. Well, Matt certainly has entered into his rest, right? Perseverance, fortitude, he's died recently, uh, but he's entered into his rest, and why? Because he not only had the fortitude of his physical fitness, but the fortitude of faith, because the Holy Spirit worked a miracle, the miracle of faith in his life through the gospel. Victory isn't for quitters. It's for those who have the fortitude of faith that carries them through to the end. And guess what? This is great news, right? Because the end is not in doubt for those of us who make our end in Christ. In his love, in his mercy, in his grace, in the great and glorious reality of his resurrection for, for us, for you. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.